Well, good morning. My name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith. We're really glad that you have come to worship with us today. Welcome to those of you who are joining us down in the venue, as well as those of you who are joining us online. Well, since October has been designated as National Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month, we wanted to acknowledge that. We wanted to mention a ministry here at Faith uh, called the Heart Ministry and pray for that as well. Uh, Heart is an acronym that stands for Helping Empty Arms Recover Together. And uh, I just want to read a brief a brief description of this from our website. Heart is a ministry which supports, comforts, and offers prayer for women who are dealing with infertility, a miscarriage, a stillbirth, or death of an infant. We offer resources for these women to have options to receive the emotional and spiritual support needed to walk through the various stages of grief and loss and to let them know that they are not alone in dealing with these painful losses. These resources include one, one one-on-one conversations with someone who has also experienced similar loss, two, a care package designed specifically for those who are dealing with miscarriage, infant loss, or infertility, and then three, grief loss support groups offered as a life group option. As a pastor, I'm so thankful for this ministry. It really embodies what Paul described in 2 Corinthians 1, where he said, we comfort others with the comfort that we have received from God. And so we have a, it's an amazing team of compassionate women who are, are reaching out and ministering to others. And so I'd like to pray for this ministry as well as those who are in sorrow even now. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being the God of all comfort. We thank you that you are near to the brokenhearted. And we ask that you would be especially near to those who've experienced the heartache of infertility or miscarriage, stillbirth, or the death of an infant. God, we ask that you would bring them comfort through your very spirit, through your word, and through your people. God, during various stages of grief, remind them that they are not alone. We pray you give them hope. Pray that you would sustain them, give them grace every step of the way. God, we thank you that you have called and equipped the body of Christ to do the very works that Christ did when he walked the earth. Thank you for raising up the heart ministry that comes alongside those who are grieving, this ministry that seeks to weep with those who weep. We pray for Autumn Raw and for Erica Stefan as they lead this ministry, lead them and their team as they bring comfort to others. And so, God, we pray that you would continue to guide this ministry. Put your hand of protection and your hand of blessing upon it. God, as we turn to your word now, uh, give us ears to hear and eyes to see. You tell us in Isaiah 66 that these are the ones that you look on with favor those who are humble and contrite in spirit, and those who tremble at your word. And so now, God, by your spirit, we humble ourselves before you. We tremble at your word, for it is true, it is essential, and it's good. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're returning to our sermon series in Psalm 23. This is the the psalm in which David said, Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have a life without lack and a life without fear. And we're encouraging you to memorize these six verses of this psalm during this, this series as a way to just hide it in your heart. There will be times when God wants to shepherd you through various situations and various ways. And if God writes that word on your heart, uh, he will bring it to mind and you'll experience him in deeper and deeper ways. And so before we look at Psalm 23.3 today, we're taking it one verse a week. Uh, I'd like to read this psalm, if you would, if you're able, please stand with me as I read this. And I uh, also wanted to mention that tonight we're having our monthly online prayer meeting. and grid. It's really going to be kind of our format. We're going to pray through this psalm. And the Zoom link is, is in the e-blast that you received on too. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word. Please be seated. Question. Why do we have such a hard time admitting when we're lost? And I'm not just talking about guys who won't stop and ask for directions, okay? I'm talking about all of us. Why do we have a hard time admitting I am lost, I can't find my way in my marriage, in this significant relationship in my life, in relation to this sinful habit, this addiction that has its, this death grip on me, in relation to my walk with God. Why do we have a hard time admitting we're lost? Well, at the heart of it, it's just this sense of pride and self-sufficiency. Most of us like to give off this vibe, I'm a competent person. I might need a little advice now and then, but being lost in the sense of needing to be rescued and brought back to a place I can't get, yeah, that's not me. I'm just taking the long way around, but I will eventually figure it out and I will eventually find my way to where I need to be. Well, from the perspective of the Bible, uh, that's very foolish. I think all of us, if, if we were in a desperate enough situation, desperate enough, dire enough straits, uh, we would all admit, admit that we're lost. It's one thing being lost in the suburbs, in a neighborhood, but it's another thing if you're out, uh, if you're out wandering in the woods or you're wandering in the mountains and it's been three days since you've had any idea where civilization is and you've run out of food, you've run out of water, and the temperatures are plummeting. If you were in that situation, you'd send up a flare, right? I would. Biblically speaking, we're all lost in the mountains, and we will die unless somebody finds us, rescues us, brings us back where we need to be. When the Bible calls someone lost, it's not an insult, okay? It's not an insult. It's just a statement that you're out of place. You're valuable, but you're in the wrong place, and you can't get yourself back in the right place. Today we're going to see from Psalm 23.3 how David describes God as a shepherd who seeks and saves lost sheep. And so we're going to look at David's experience and then we're going to talk about how we can have the same experience in our lives. How Jesus can be our good shepherd who, who seeks us, saves us, brings us where we need to be. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Psalm 23.3, David's experience of the Lord as his shepherd. And notice how David describes the Lord, his shepherd, in this verse, what he did for him. He says, he restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's a traditional translation of that first line, he restores my soul. And the sense we get, the impression we get in that translation is that I'm exhausted, I'm weary, and God refreshes me. He blows wind in my sail, and now I can, I can live my life again. And God certainly does that. But the image here is very likely much more concrete, much more tangible, giving the image, imagery of a shepherd and a sheep. The word translated restore, it's just the common word for return or it's often translated repent. And the word for soul, it's a, it means a living being and it's often just refers to me as a person. And so very likely what David is saying here is that when I am like a lost sheep and I am wandering on the wrong path, the path of unrighteousness, Yahweh, my shepherd, he seeks me out, he finds me, he returns me, and then he leads me on the right path. He leads me on the paths of righteousness. And he does this 
for his name's sake. And in the Bible, a name is not just a title. It's not like you're at a conference, hello, my name is Yahweh. That's what you should call me. No, God's name signifies everything he is and everything he does, his character. And so the name of God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. What changes is his reputation, the way people think about and talk about his character and his name. And that's the thing that fluctuates. And in this world, it fluctuates with the behavior of his people, those who bear his name. And so uh, when his reputation rises or fall, falls depending on his people. So when David strayed and took the wrong path, the Lord returned him and led him in the right path for the sake of his reputation. And so David isn't saying that God is the dad who says, no kid of mine's going to embarrass this family's name. We just don't act like that. No, God understood that his, his kids sin. He understood that his children wander off and take the wrong path. Uh, now, David is saying is that God, being consistent with his character, with his name, he returns me, he brings me back home, and then he guides me in the right path, the paths of righteousness. After all, when Moses said, God, show me your glory, God said, I'm going to pass before you, and I'm going to tell you my name. And this is the long name of God. It's in, it's in Exodus 34, 6. God said, this is my name. I'm compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love and kindness and in truth. And so when, David, when God brought David back as a lost sheep, he was, he was exhibiting his name, and his reputation swelled. And so that's the imagery. An obvious example of how this happened in David's life, it's recorded in 2 Samuel 10 and 11. Those chapters were, uh, explain how uh, David went down a very unrighteous path, and he was profoundly lost. Uh, David uh, coveted his neighbor's wife. He took her. Her name was Bathsheba. He slept with her. And then to try to cover it up, he committed murder. He had, his, he had his, uh, her husband killed in battle. And so David was profoundly lost. He was in the wrong place relationally with his neighbor and with his God. He was in the wrong place. Uh, he should have been at war. David was in the wrong place, place geographically. He was in the wrong place spiritually. He was lost. And God, being the shepherd that he is, he sought him out. He sought out David. And he returned him, and he put him on the right path. And he did it through the prophet Nathan. What a courageous guy. Nathan went and told David this story. David thought it was an actual, actual events that had happened. Nathan said, there's a very rich man, and he has many herds, many sheep. And there's a poor man who has one single, solitary, beloved uh, lamb. The rich man had some company. Instead of slaughtering one of his many sheep, he took that one beloved lamb, he killed it, and he served it to his, to his guests. And David, he was a shepherd, and he was outraged. He said, that man deserves to die. And Nathan said, David, you are the man. David's immediate response, we're told in 2 Samuel 11, David, or 2 Samuel uh, 12, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. He didn't bluff, he didn't bluster, he didn't try to explain, he didn't make excuses. I have sinned against the Lord. And there were consequences in David's life. The fallout was just, just horrific. But God, being the shepherd he is, he found David. David repented. He, David returned. And then he walked in paths of righteousness. During the days of David, God's reputation as a good shepherd, it swelled and it grew and it expanded. Everybody could look at David's life and say, yeah, God is that kind of shepherd. And so Psalm 23 is exclusively about the Lord as David's shepherd. You don't have anything here about how David welcomed the uh, Lord and allowed God to shepherd him. But the context of the surrounding Psalms that were written by David and the context of the entire book of Psalms make clear that that was actually the case. And so not everybody could write Psalm 23. The Lord brings me back. He puts me on the right path. But David could because he allowed God to be his shepherd. And so, for example, in, in Psalm 1, we read this. 
verses 1 and 2. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And so Psalm 1, really all of the Psalms really uh, tease this out, that if you want to find a blessed person, that's a person who's preoccupied with God's law, with God's instruction. If you want to use the terminology of Psalm 23, the person who experienced blessing is the one who listens for the voice of the shepherd, the sheep who follows the shepherd into these paths of righteousness. And so... Uh, In Psalm 19, uh, after writing how God speaks through creation, David writes about how God speaks through his word. This is going to sound very familiar if you've been paying attention. We read this. The law, this is Psalm 19, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. It's the same two terms. The law of the Lord is perfect because it restores our souls. And so if you put it together, you would say that the Lord was David's shepherd because David delighted in the law of the Lord. And when he didn't, God brought his word and that word brought him back. It it returned him to the place where he was walking in paths of righteousness again. And so David would not have been able to write Psalm 23 if he didn't listen to the shepherd's voice. And so that was David's experience. Would you like that experience? Do you want that to be true of you? If you're even just halfway honest, you'd say, yeah, there are times when I take the wrong path and I find myself, I'm just looking around like, how did I get here? I am absolutely out of place in all the ways that really matter. I need to be brought back. I need to be returned. I need to be led. I need to be guided. I'm clueless. I need to be guided in the right path. Well, how can we experience the Lord as our shepherd? Well, let's talk about our experience of Jesus as our good shepherd. When you have the chance, I'd encourage you to read three chapters in the prophets. And they, they really set the context for Jesus as a good shepherd. And these are in the, the sermon outline that's on the website. But they're Jeremiah 23. So Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 34, and Zechariah 10. And what you find in those three chapters is that very few kings of Israel allowed God to be their shepherd. Consequently, very few of them shepherded, led the nation of Israel. And so by and large, the whole, the whole nation was, what, what you read in those chapters, that they are a lost flock. The whole flock is out of place. They're in Assyria. They're in Egypt. They're in Babylon. They need to be brought back. And in a series of stunning promises, God says, I myself, I will do what these kings of Israel did not and could not do. I will find my lost sheep. I will bring them back to myself and to the land. You fast forward hundreds of years later, Jesus comes into Jerusalem. He made very clear through his words, through the things he said and through the things he did, I am that shepherd. I am Yahweh in the flesh, and I am going to actually bring you back to God himself. And so he was the ultimate fulfillment of those prophecies in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Luke 15. We're going to spend the rest of our time here. We're not going to begin to do justice to this amazing chapter, but we're going to see that in this chapter, Jesus fills out the imagery in Psalm 23, 3, and he explains how we can experience him as a shepherd who returns us and leads us in paths of righteousness for God's namesake. Verses 1 and 2 set the, the context here. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago as well. <clears throat> This is what we read, Luke 15, 1 and 2. Now the, all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes, they began to grumble. Some translations say murmur. They began to murmur against him, saying, This man receives sinners and he eats with them. 
And so that was scandalous to the, the scribes and the Pharisees because those are the type of people you should avoid at all costs, not the type of people you should befriend because uh, eating with someone represented relationship and acceptance. And so they said, Jesus, this is danger. if you want to, dangerous. If you want to start some spiritual movement, why are you cavorting with all these deviants, okay? Why are you just spending all this time with these immoral people? Well, Jesus explains himself by telling three parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sons. We're going to take them one by one. Parable of the lost sheep. Uh, Jesus had the scribes and Pharisees imagine a scenario. Say, imagine you have a hundred sheep and one of them is lost. You've lost it, actually. Which one among you won't leave the 99 in the open field and go and find that one lost sheep? Well, all of you would, and here's what you'd do. You'd find that sheep, you would bind it up, you'd put it on your shoulders, and you would be so overjoyed that when you get home, you would call your friends and your neighbors, and you'd say, celebrate with me, rejoice, for this lost sheep has been found. Here's the takeaway in verse 7. I tell you, Jesus says, that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus, he was telling them, I befriend tax collectors and sinners because I'm a good shepherd, because I am seeking and saving lost people. The tax collectors and sinners, they're lost and they'll admit it, okay? And you notice how he describes the, the, the lost sheep being brought back home? He says that is what, that, that is, is, is a picture of, of a sinner who repents. I find somebody, they repent, and they come back home. That's what a, that's what a found sheep does, is follows, comes back, comes back home. And so there's this stereotype of God of being... And it's really blasphemous that God is basically angry and vengeful, and the thing he loves doing is punishing sinners. Oh, what we find here, what really delights the heart of God, is when one sinner repents and comes back home. He's a good shepherd. He wants the sheep back home. That's what brings him joy. The lost sheep, the lost coin. Let me just read this parable in verses 8 through 10. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? We'd all do that. If you lose something valuable, I mean, you're going to turn the place upside down. Verse 9, when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. The takeaway, in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So what does this add to our understanding of being lost? Well, it, it makes very clear that being lost doesn't mean that you're worthless. No, you can be lost and be worth a, an incredible amount. That's why she turned the house upside down. And so understand this, if you are lost, okay, if you are lost, Make no mistake, you are of infinite value because you are created in the image of God. As a matter of fact, you were designed to embody the beauty and the moral excellence of God himself. And if you repent, if you turn and you go back to God, there will be joy in the presence of the angels and in the presence of God himself. It's just a staggering thing to consider. That's the case. Finally, we come to the, the parable of the lost son. Tim, Tim Keller points out it's actually both sons were lost. And this is a fascinating story. This man had two sons. There's a lot of nuance here. Won't, won't be able to touch on the vast majority of it. But he had two sons. And the younger son came to his dad and he said, Dad, I want my share of the inheritance. In other words, he's like saying, uh, Dad, I wish you were dead because I want your money. Okay, And in a shocking turn of events, the father said, okay, here it is. He gave him a share of his estate. This younger son uh, went to a faraway land, and he squandered his entire estate through partying. And he was profoundly lost. 
geographically he was out of place, relationally he was out of place, spiritually, morally, in every way possible he was out of place. But when he came to his senses, he had this memory. And what he realized was the servants in my father's household, they have plenty to eat. But here I am in this faraway country and I'm starving to death. And so he decides, I'm going to go back home. I'm going to go back home. And while he's on the way back, he, he rehearses this, this speech. And so he's going to tell his father, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be your son. I'm just going to work my way into the household now. I'm just going to be a servant, and I will earn everything that you give me. So he comes back home, and Jesus says, there's all these details are just fascinating. It says, when he was a long way off, his father saw him. And so that's the image of the dad's out. He's out at the end of the driveway, and he's looking for the son. And when he sees him, it says he ran. He ran to him. He fell to his knees. He, he embraced him. He kissed him. And the, the son starts this speech, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be your servant, Let me or to be your son. Let me, he says, bring the fatted calf, put a robe on him, put ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, kill the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate because this son of mine, he was dead. He's come back to life. He was lost and he's been found. The older brother, he is angry because the father is using his eventual inheritance to pay for this party and now he's going to support this son who he says he squandered his whole inheritance with prostitutes. And so the father explains to him, he says, he, he explains why he had to, to, to celebrate, why welcome the younger son back into the household. Verse 32, but we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. If you were here today and you were lost, I hope that these scriptures we've looked at make abundantly clear that you are exactly the type of person that Jesus is seeking. He wants to save you. He wants to bring you back into his household. He wants to lead you in the right path. The only thing you have to do is to raise your hand and say, I just, I admit it, I am profoundly lost. I'm out of place and I don't know how to get where I need to get. And actually, I believe that Jesus, I was so sinful that someone had to die for my sin. I believe Jesus is that one. He came from heaven. He sought me out. He came to seek and save that which is lost. He died on the cross as payment for my sins. And so I trust him. I trust him. I believe. And through him, by as a purely a gift of God, I come back home. And I want, to, I want to walk with Jesus in these paths of righteousness. I want him to guide me. And I will tell you this as well. If you have a friend or you have a couple of friends that have taken a risk and they have talked with you about these things and they've explained some of these things to you, that's Jesus seeking you out and saving you. When I was 20 years old, uh, I had these three friends. I didn't know I was lost, okay? I was, I mean, I was a poser like most people I knew. I mean, everything was fun. These, guys, these three guys, Bob and Joel and Stu Jay, they sought me out. They befriended me. They began showing me what a life with Christ looks like. They spoke the gospel to me, and I absolutely fell in love with Jesus through their lifestyle. And so when I repented, there was joy in heaven. There was joy in heaven because God's son had come back home. And that's the offer to you. It is free. God doesn't make deals with people. He doesn't bargain. He doesn't let you work or pay anything off because you can't earn it. You just receive it. Come back home. Repent. Believe the gospel. If you are already a believer, the passages that we've considered today should humble you to the core. They should absolutely make you say, I have to walk humbly with my God. In other words, I have to live a lifestyle of repentance. And so our claim to fame as Christians, we express it every time we sing Amazing Grace. You know our biggest claim to fame? I once was lost, lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, 
now I see. It's not that I've found my way back. It's not that I've given myself sight. Nope, God has done all of this for me. That being the case, I would ask you, if you're a believer, if you profess faith in Christ, when was the last time you set up a flare and you just admitted in some area of your life, I am lost. I'm lost in this relationship I'm in. I'm lost morally. I've got this addiction. I've got this, this sinful habit. And I don't have a clue how I can get out, get out of it. I'm lost in my relationship with God. I know Bible verses. I see people, they look like they're walking with God. But I am clueless about how to get to, to where I need to be. When was the last time that you, you just admitted that you were lost and invited Jesus to find you, bring you back, and lead you in the right path? You're either going to be the younger brother or the older brother. You're either going to live a lifestyle of repentance or you're going to be that person that just looks at everybody else and you just perpetually critique them because they're not as clued in as you are. But throughout Scripture, the, the lifestyle, the pattern for believers is always be open to the possibility that there are areas in my life where I am on the wrong path. And so we pray. Search me, O oh God. Show me if there's anything within me, anything in my heart that takes me down the wrong path and lead me in the right path. Show me the, the eternal way. Now, we're people, it says in James 5, we're to be people who actually confess our sins to one another. You have a trusted friend, a trusted brother, sister in Christ. We, we confess our sins to one another and we pray for one another so that we might be healed. That's a, that's a lifestyle of repentance. And we, we are, are urged to be people who abide in Christ and let his word abide in us. The dominant voice in our heads is the voice of our good shepherd. We abide in Christ. We don't just, just dabble in it. We let his word wash over us and we're immersed in his truth. And if that's the case, and only if that's the case, can we say with David, the Lord, my shepherd, when I'm lost, when I'm on the wrong path, he finds me. He helps, he, he makes me repent, he returns me, and then he guides me in the right path, the path of righteousness. And through my life, the reputation of God, it swells and grows. Heavenly Father, you, you've given us a vision in, in Psalm 23 of an amazing life where you lead us, you rescue us, you bring us back. Father, we pray that this would be our case. I pray for the person who's hearing my voice now, who is lost in an ultimate sense, who's never bowed the knee to Jesus. I pray that you would give him or her this humility, this desire, this vision for their life to bow the knee, just admit, I'm lost. Jesus, you're the only one that can find me and bring me back. And I uh, pray that that person would repent and be born from above and experience this, this life without lack and this life without fear. God, for those who already know you, I pray that we would walk humbly with you, that we would have this lifestyle of humility, that we wouldn't fake it, we wouldn't uh, just pretend that everything's fine when it's not. God, give us the, the humility we need to walk humbly with you and let you be our good shepherd. I pray we would welcome that through prayer, through relationships, through the word. And God, it's all for your name's sake. God, our, our names are pretty irrelevant here. We want your name, your reputation uh, to be the thing that matters. And so we pray these things in faith. This is what we really want. So we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.